Item number, SCP-027. Object class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. The host of SCP-027, currently subject 027-02, is to be kept in a 5 meter by 5 meter containment cell with a graded, raised floor connected to a strong vacuum system. All creatures removed from the subject's containment cell are to be incinerated, except for a small portion to be diverted for analysis and necropsy. The cell is to be cleaned and inspected for structural damage daily. Subject 027-02 must be monitored by at least two personnel at all times. Any unusual behavior or vital signs on the part of the subject, or the appearance of any unusual species in the subject's vicinity, must be immediately reported to Level 4 personnel. Security personnel assigned to SCP-027 must be inoculated against all known animal-borne pathogens, and must be armed with tranquilizer guns, with standing orders to subdue the subject if the need arises. Until SCP-027 is better understood, no personnel of Level 4 clearance or higher should approach within 200 meters of the subject. Description: SCP-027 appears to be a phenomenon of unknown source that seems to be tied to one human subject, currently 027-02, at a time. As a host to SCP-027, subject 027-02 is constantly surrounded by swarming vermin that are drawn to his location. The subject does not appear to be able to assert control over these creatures in any way, and is in fact prone to occasional attacks from feral specimens. These creatures have also been known to attack personnel who approach too closely. Wherever the subject goes, an initial swarm of flying insects, such as gnats and flies, will start to form a cloud around him, usually within two to three minutes. Shortly thereafter, crawling animals including lice, cockroaches, worms, spiders, data expunged, mice, and rats will begin to appear. The longer the subject remains in a location, the more vermin will gather there. When the subject leaves a location, some of these creatures will follow but most will disperse. SCP-027 has been known to transfer between hosts once, upon the death of the first known host, Subject 027-01. Since SCP-027 could likely repeat this feat upon the death of Subject 027-02, all high-value personnel should be kept far away from the current host, until more about SCP-027 is understood. SCP-027 has also likely transferred between hosts an unknown number of times before containment. Research into potential previous hosts has commenced, with preliminary evidence suggesting that SCP-027 may have existed for at least years. It is not yet known how SCP-027 chooses or attracts animals, or even what SCP-027 exactly is. The previous host never expressed having any sort of communication with a separate conscious entity. Analysis of the current host has been inconclusive at best. Appendix 1. Timeline of Significant Events. April 1990 Subject 027-01 is discovered in an abandoned warehouse outside that had been completely overrun by rats, cockroaches, and other vermin and is contained and cataloged as SCP-027. The subject is described as a Caucasian male in his late 30s, of average height, but gaunt, filthy, and covered in bites and scratches. The subject also shows symptoms of degraded mental health, evidence of heavy use of alcohol and illicit drugs, and signs of prolonged sleep deprivation. October 2000 Subject expires. Autopsy shows more than 70% of the subject's body data expunged, a colony of rats nesting in the subject's abdomen for at least generations. October 2000 Between 140 and 150 hours after the subject's death, security officer K reports being awoken by breathing problems due to a large housefly having crawled up his nose, later shown to have lain eggs. Subsequent observations led to categorization of Officer Subject 027-02. The original host is reclassified as Subject 027-01, and SCP-027 is redefined. Data expunged. Appendix 2. Transcript of Interview. 027-201. The following interview was conducted on October 2000. 
shortly after Subject 027-02 was identified and transferred to the containment cell that had housed Subject 027-01. Dr. Jameson. Good morning, Officer Fr How are you feeling? Subject 027-02. Scared. Confused. Mostly scared, though. J. Understandable. S. And itchy. Feel like I need to shower all the damn time. J. Ah. But what about, um, inside? Do you feel anything different inside you? Like a... Presence? S. Thinks and scratches his head. No, I don't think I do. I haven't really noticed anything like that. J. You haven't felt anything different since the original host died, besides the itching. S. No, I can't say I have. J. What about any sort of voices or compulsions? S. Agitated. No, I haven't felt anything except bugs crawling all over me. Feel dirty and scared and... Doc, what about my family? You gotta get this thing out of me so I can see them again. J. Of... of course. Going to do everything we can to get 027 out of you. God, I... I'm sorry, Chris. Note. Shortly after this interview took place, Dr. Jameson and several other members of the research team for SCP-027 were transferred to the SCP-1772 project. Item number. SCP-149. Object Class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-149, in any of its instances, is to be kept inside a sealed plexiglass box for observation. Oxygen and a nutrient mist are to be released into the containment cell every two hours. If any instance of SCP-149 escapes its cell, Protocol 42 Charlie is to be brought into effect on any and all contaminated personnel by order of 0512 after Incident 149-1. Description SCP-149 is a breed of mosquito which carries a strain of retrovirus, herein referred to as SCP-149-A, that mutates regenerating human cells into fertilized mosquito eggs. SCP-149-A is injected directly into the bloodstream when SCP-149 feeds. The SCP-149-A quickly works on the nucleus of the cells, warping the DNA. The first set of cells bred from these changed instructions closely resemble cysts, and are concentrated in the lining of the esophagus and the sinuses. Upon dissection, however, these cysts are revealed to be filled with SCP-149's larva, the cysts acting as a protective casing against external forces. SCP-149 appears to go through its maturation cycle in a matter of hours. By the time the subject is able to feel any effects, the first generation of SCP-149 has already grown inside the subject's body. SCP-149 primarily achieves exodus through the mouth and nostrils, occasionally being diverted through the sphenoid sinuses to escape through the eye sockets. Infection by SCP-149 is fatal, and chance of infection has been estimated to be 50% from one bite. Addendum Incident 149-1 In incidents of SCP-149 escaped, and infected multiple Class D subjects, the majority of whom did not report SCP-149's contact with them. Within five hours, SCP-149 had matured in these hosts and burst out of them, infecting several staff members. It was only thanks to the quick thinking of Dr. who sealed sublevels 12 through 15 that the entire site was not infected. As a response to this, O5 Command has created Protocol 42 Charlie to be used if SCP-149 escapes confinement. Item Number SCP-150 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-150 patients kept for study should be contained in Level 3 Biohazard Containment Cells with no more than one instance per cell. Cultures of SCP-150 are contained in vacuum-sealed glass flasks in the Site-42 Infectious Materials Lab. Standard pathogen handling procedures should be followed at all times. Any instances of SCP-150 found outside of containment are to be incinerated. Description SCP-150 is an obligate parasite that resembles the tongue-eating louse. 
Psymathoa exigua, but is adapted to form conjunctive symbiotic relationships with humans for a period of its lifespan. Upon contact with a human subject, SCP-150 embeds itself deeply in the flesh of its host. Over the course of approximately seven days, the parasite will burrow into the host and affect numerous physiological alterations. The most glaring alteration is the gradual conversion of the limb nearest the infection site into a chitinous appendage. As SCP-150 consumes the host's flesh, it excretes tissue that replaces and augments the functionality of the host's limb without causing transplant rejection. It is suspected that SCP-150 is able to secrete anesthetic and immunosuppressant substances to prevent the host's body from responding to the change. Furthermore, the nervous tissue excreted by SCP-150 is able to interface with the host's nervous system. By the time the process is complete, the host will be able to control the affected limb with no loss in mobility and often with improved strength, reflexes, and resilience. For a period of one to two weeks, SCP-150 will reproduce, feeding on nutrients from and depositing eggs into assimilated blood vessels. It is hypothesized that SCP-150 can self-fertilize. The eggs are deposited throughout the human body via the bloodstream, while the vast majority of them die off. Enough survive to begin colonizing and altering the rest of the host's body. Though subjects report discomfort and occasional loss of motor control during this process, they often will not recognize the cause of said discomfort. It is still unclear why the offspring do not compete with each other for space or resources, nor how the assimilation process leaves the body's cell signaling mechanisms and processes unaffected. SCP-150 reproduces during this assimilation process, as the lungs are assimilated. More eggs are produced and spread by the patient's coughing. Although as many as 10,000 eggs may be produced during this time, it is estimated that only 1% of them find their way into another host, of which 1% survive the host's immune response and implant successfully. Although SCP-150 inevitably results in the assimilation and alteration of the central nervous system, including the spinal cord and brain, the host's consciousness and behavior are seemingly unaffected. Interviews with subjects infected by SCP-150 have yielded little information, as infected subjects unaware of SCP-150 claim to sense no changes or improvement in certain senses and faculties. While subjects aware of the infection are able to pinpoint the source of the change, they exhibit little to no negative feelings and often express positivity towards it. Addendum 150E Transcript of Exploratory Leucotomy and Nervous Tissue Transformation Experiments Two D-Class Subjects, D-13732 and D-016002, were infected with SCP-150 and allowed to progress through all stages of the infection. In order to examine the full effect of the infection, exploratory neurosurgeries were performed on both subjects. D-13732 was euthanized. His nervous tissue was found to have been entirely replaced by smaller instances of SCP-150. The instances comprising his brain matter were extracted and stored for experimentation on D016002. The following decompressive craniotomy and leucotomy were performed by Dr. Harlan's son, Dr. Wendy Robin, and Dr. Alex Harlow on D016002. A full transcript follows. Begin log. 2143. D016002 is partially anesthetized to numb her during the initial drilling of the skull. The process is uneventful, though Harlow reports expecting less resistance from the skull while drilling into and cutting a flap from it. Upon removing the flap of bone and exposing the dura mater, numerous smaller instances of SCP-150 are observed lying in the cranial cavity where the brain should be. Harlow reports this to Robin who alerts Sun to begin the interview process while she marks off areas of D016002's brain on a mapping projection. Dr. Sun, what is your name? D016002, Mako Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002, chair. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002, green. Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? 
D016002 pauses for a moment. D016002. Two. Dr. Robin. We have marked off the approximate location of the Wernix area, the part of the brain that controls speech recognition and use. Dr. Harlow. Thank you, Doctor. Son, I will now extract some of the specimens from this area. Dr. Harlow carefully makes an incision into the dura mater and extracts some of the instances from the area using forceps. He places each instance into a glass vial, corks it, and places it on a nearby stand. Each instance appears to stir to life and begin wriggling only upon being removed. This process takes approximately 10 minutes, during which time Sun repeatedly asks D016002 the same questions. Once Harlow has extracted approximately 100 instances, he gestures for Sun to continue. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002, uh, uh, seat. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002, green? Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? D016002, two. Dr. Sun, note for the record that D016002's responses have been slightly slowed. This indicates that the instances within her cranial cavity are indeed acting as neuron analogs though it is unclear as to how many neurons each instance is equivalent to. Dr. Harlow, I am placing a sample of neural tissue acquired from D13732 into D016002 now. The instances from D13732 have been tagged with a radioactive luminescent dye to distinguish them for extraction later. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002, couch. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002, blue. Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? D016002, two. Dr. Sun, what is 10 times 11? D016002, 111. Dr. Sun, D016002's responses have returned to normal speed. This suggests that it is possible for 150 nervous tissue to be swapped freely between host individuals without rejection. We will now begin the final procedure. D016002, you will be given a full general anesthetic. D016002 is subjected to a general anesthetic, which takes several seconds to begin. Dr. Sun, the patient is now under full anesthesia. Dr. Harlow, you may begin the process of tissue extraction. For this final procedure, we will be attempting to completely replace the brain tissue of D016002 with that of D13732. Previously, during the exploration of D13732's cranial cavity, Dr. Harlow and I observed that the instances connecting his brain matter to his spinal matter were not secured in any way, and in fact seemed to be switching positions with other instances in the brain. We will be seeing how far this compatibility extends. There is silence for the next hour, as doctors Harlow, Sun, and Robin remove the top of D016002's skull and begin extracting her brain matter into a large glass container. Dr. Sun, extraction complete. D016002's brain matter has been successfully removed. Dr. Harlow is now placing D13732's brain matter into D016002's exposed cranial cavity. Silence for several minutes. Dr. Robin, heart rate steady. We have a pulse and breathing. Give it another minute. All right, I'm going to wake her up. There is a pause as Dr. Robin reduces the anesthesia and D016002 awakens. Dr. Sun, what is your name? D016002, Michael. Dr. Harlow, faintly heard in background. Jesus. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002, beanbags. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002, green. Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? Quiet sloshing can be detected by the microphone. Dr. Robin, hey, uh, Sun? D016002, two. 
Dr. Robin, son, look. D016002's brain is shown to move of its own accord, subtly moving back and forth. Dr. Harlow, well, that's new. Dr. Sun, do you feel any pain anywhere in your body? D016002, my chest is kind of heavy, feels just the same otherwise. Dr. Sun, good to hear. Now, what is D016002? Hey, I usually feel pretty energetic, even before surgeries, but I'm kind of tired right now. Lately, I've been exercising before I sleep, but since I can't sleep here, is it okay if I can just rest a little bit? Dr. Sun, rest. D016002, like three, five minutes. I can do that here if it's okay. A small portion of the top of D016002's brain parts before making a gurgling sound. After the portion closes, sections of D016002's brain retracts into itself rapidly. D016002's eyes close. Dr. Sun, that doesn't seem good. Dr. Robin steps away from the operation, making retching sounds as she leaves the room. Dr. Harlow, D016, uh, D13732, are you okay? D016002, yeah, yawns. I'm fine, why do you ask? Item number, SCP-302, object class, safe. Special Containment Procedures SCP-302 is to be kept in sight under Safe 3 protocols. Artifacts should be handled with gloves at all times, and utmost precautions should be taken to ensure that the artifact does not make skin contact with unauthorized personnel. Any personnel not scheduled for testing that begin showing signs of SCP-302's effects may apply for termination. All subjects suffering from SCP-302's affliction should be terminated after no longer than eight days due to data expunged. Description SCP-302 is a small tin sculpture with a bronze patina finish depicting two ants carrying a leaf. Whenever a human makes direct skin contact with the artifact, they will invariably find a single, small, relatively harmless ant on their person within two hours. This ant may belong to any of several different small ant species, and its appearance rarely causes much alarm. It is of note that in all recorded cases, subjects have always distinctly noticed this first ant and fully remember seeing it. Thereafter, an exponentially increasing number of ants will appear on the exposed subject by day. Throughout the entire day, the number of ants that appear seems to be in the range of 3x to 5x, where x is the number of days since initial contact with SCP-302. As time progresses, the ants not only increase in number, but also change in species. Smaller, minimally harmful species appear at first, later transitioning to larger species, or species with more painful stings or bites. Ants seem to appear out of the nearest unobserved space. This includes from under clothes, nearby objects, or, if left with no alternatives, bodily orifices. Ants seem singularly preoccupied with exploring or attacking the affected individual, and will not stop until either themselves or the subject is deceased. Addendum 3021 Subject of Test Log 2 was a single D-Class personnel. Subject was told he was to participate in a study testing how a week of relaxation might affect the performance of D-Class personnel and was kept in a relaxation chamber with exercise equipment, various books and magazines, and a color television. Subject was exposed to SCP-302 without his knowledge. Test Log 2 Days 1 and 2. Subject spends his time in leisurely pursuits. Subject expresses great satisfaction and reports nothing out of the ordinary. Day 3. Subject reports small ant problem and admits it is probably his fault for letting crumbs fall all over the couch and carpet. Subject admits he noticed an ant two days previous, but did not think it was worth mentioning. 
Subject reports great satisfaction otherwise, and requests a can of bug spray. Day 4 Subject reports that ant problem persists despite his best efforts to spray the room, and that the ants have become more numerous, and occasionally painful. Subject reports that the ants seem bigger and different from those he saw the day before. Subject still reports relative happiness with the experiment. Day 5 Subject reports great annoyance and increased pain, as ants are now nearly always on his person. Ants seem to have changed once more, becoming more aggressive and agitated. At this point, Subject clearly suspects ants are not of a normal nature. Day 6 Subject in great pain On average, five tropical greenhead ants are seen to appear every minute on Subject throughout entire day. Subject becomes aggressive due to pain and demands to be released from chamber. Pretense for experiment is dropped and Subject is restrained and given medical attention. Day 7 Subject in great pain An average of 25 tropical fire ants are seen to appear every minute on Subject. Subject requires continuous ant removal. Day 8 Subject is heavily medicated and unconscious through majority of day. An average of 140 bullet ants appear on subject each minute. Rapid ant removal and anti-inflammatory medicine is necessary. Day 9 Data expunged. Subject and experiment are terminated. Item Number SCP-378 Object Class Thaumiel Notice from the Foundation Records and Information Security Administration. Following the implementation of the Kraken Protocol on 2706-1963, containment procedures for SCP-378 have been updated. Personnel assigned to the SCP-378 project are to review its updated documentation as soon as possible. Claudia Southey, Director, RISA. Special Containment Procedures SCP-378 is to be contained in a subterranean entity containment terrarium. Temperature and humidity are to be maintained at levels optimal for the growth and habitation of Heterodermia cane crow, Utica cave lichen, and Prenolepis everettman, North American cave ant. Twice per year, SCP-378 is to undergo a medical and psychological examination. Access to SCP-378's containment terrarium is separated from the surrounding facility by a decontamination chamber. Handling personnel are required to wear full body protection and must be screened for SCP-378-A prior to exiting decontamination. Infected personnel are to be terminated unless the position of SCP-378-1 or 3 is vacant, in which case they are to be assigned to the relevant position instead. As of the adoption of the Kraken Protocol, SCP-378's containment is focused on maintaining its three primary containment components. SCP-3781 is housed in the Area 19 barracks. SCP-3781 is employed as a maintenance technician with a security clearance of O-A19. Upon the death of the current SCP-3781, brain-dead or comatose reserve personnel may be elected to replace it. As SCP-3781 is the primary means of communication with SCP-378, care must be maintained to keep SCP-3781's vocal functions in working order. SCP-3782 currently takes the form of David Lockheed, a 36-year-old Caucasian male and the employee of the American Supernatural Containment Initiative ASCII, as a clerical aide, to maintain the continued operations of the SCP Foundation in the United States. SCP-3782 has been tasked with sabotaging ASCII operations against the Foundation, as well as collecting information in the Foundation's interests. SCP-3782 is expected to follow a strict health and exercise regimen due to the inherent difficulty in replacing it. SCP-3783 currently takes the form of Lisa Martin, a 33-year-old Mexican-American female employee at the Spicy Crust Pizza in Staten Island. In the event of SCP-3783's death, it must be replaced as soon as possible. Each component is fitted with a tracking device and an audio recorder. Each week, Embedded agents stationed near each component are to evaluate the health and integrity of each component and its associated surveillance equipment. 
The utilization of SCP-378-A in further infiltration is pending Foundation Overwatch approval. Description SCP-378 is an arthropod, superficially resembling a deformed larval instance of Scolopendra gigantea, the Amazonian giant centipede. SCP-378's legs are largely vestigial, primarily meant to assist in peristaltic locomotion. SCP-378 measures 3 meters from mouth to anus, with a bodily thickness of 1 meter and a weight of 233 kilograms. Under normal conditions, SCP-378 is an omnivore, with a diet consisting primarily of lichen and insects. SCP-378 is capable of asexual reproduction at will, producing instances of SCP-378-A from its anus. Instances of SCP-378-A resemble adult Scolopendra gigantea. Dissection suggests this resemblance is superficial, as SCP-378-A lack expected organ systems beyond a primitive neural network. Instances of SCP-378-A are controlled remotely by SCP-378. SCP-378-A are obligate endoparasites, infecting advanced primates such as humans, Homo ignotus, Data Expunged, and Gigantopithecus sapiens, Common Sasquatch. Upon infection, SCP-378-A integrates itself with its host's nervous system through poorly understood means, inducing brain death and extending SCP-378's remote control to the host itself. Vital functions and sensory input remain unaffected. Upon infecting a suitable host, SCP-378 will attempt to reintegrate its hosts into their respective species' social sphere. Once integrated, SCP-378 directs its hosts to indefinitely engage in the behaviors typical for its species, such as communal labor and social recreation. Human hosts prefer environments with a high population density and a robust entertainment scene. The upper limit of active hosts SCP-378 can maintain at any one time is unknown. Upon initial interrogation, SCP-378 confessed to the existence of 26 human hosts, as well as two instances of Aluata Pigra, Guatemalan Black Howler, and three instances of SCP-1000, of which it noted had been acquired during a period of heavy intoxication. Addendum 178-294-B a Psychological Evaluation of SCP-378 Conducted by Dr. Simon Glass Tentatively designated Scolopendra Animalia, SCP-378 is unique among arthropods, possessing either human levels of sapience or the ability to emulate its host's intellectual faculties. In any case, SCP-378 is self-aware and remarkably intelligent. SCP-378's relationship to its hosts is complicated. While SCP-378 maintains a consistent sense of identity across multiple hosts, each is treated as a persona for SCP-378 to roleplay. Hosts rarely interact with SCP-378 or fellow hosts, suggesting SCP-378 primarily utilizes its anomalous abilities for entertainment. This is further suggested by SCP-378's readiness to abandon such personas under duress. Aside from integration into human social spheres, host behavior is largely unique to each instance. Extroversion is relatively common. Hosts rarely isolate themselves except to sleep or excrete. SCP-378 appears to take equal enthusiasm in stressful versus pleasant situations. Of note, SCP-378 is particularly attached to the identity of Lisa Martin. In contrast to other hosts, Lisa Martin's weekly routine is relatively static. From 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on all days except Saturday, Miss Martin will show up to work at the nearest pizzeria from the former location of Digian Antonio's Pies, regardless of employment status or scheduled hours. From 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. on all days except Saturday, Miss Martin will engage in the maintenance of one of 17 rooftop gardens across the city of New York. Of these, 13 are maintained by a cooperative, 12 of which Miss Martin is not a part of. From 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturdays, Miss Martin alternates between socializing with a collection of friends, co-workers, and lovers, and playing piano for various high-end bars. From 11 p.m. to 12 a.m., Miss Martin will shower, 
and prepare for bed. Miss Martin will sleep from 12 a.m. to 7 a.m. when she will wake up and prepare for the next cycle. In the event of Miss Martin's death, SCP-378 will direct another host to assume her identity. Attempts to interrupt Miss Martin's routine have been unilaterally met with unusual levels of hostility from SCP-378 and its hosts. From Assistant Director Daniela Hayden, Classification Level Rise of 4, Employee Number 134, to Director Kelsey Feinstein, Classification Level XK4, Employee Number 87, Regarding, 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 Identifying Current Hosts, Date, 2704-1963, Director Feinstein, Mr. Song and Dr. Glass's work have revealed quite a bit about SCP-378. Most importantly, I do not believe it understands the significance of social dynamics, especially in regards to hierarchy and social capital. Several of SCP-378's identities held surprising positions of power. Indeed, two of them, David Lockheed and Alfonso Liaz, are beyond reach of the Foundation's current capacity to contain. Despite this, SCP-378 has shown a willingness to sacrifice such hosts in order to defend, replace, or otherwise maintain Lisa Martin. Odd, yes, but useful enough. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to Miss Martin and her friends, would it not? SCP-378 is sapient, but it by no means understands the significance of its actions. With a little bit of persuasion, David Lockheed might yet ascend from petty paper pusher for the ASCII, right where the Foundation most needs a puppet. And, if I'm not mistaken, spicy crust pizza can always do with a second franchise. Proposal Employing SCP-378's anomalous abilities to defend Foundation operations in the United States. Council Vote Summary Approved Proposal Accepted the Kraken Protocol has been initiated. From Senior Researcher Sang Hun Song, Classification Level Gamma U3, Employee Number 148, to Director Kelsey Feinstein, Classification Level XK4, Employee Number 87, Regarding Delays in the Gamma U2677 Project, Date 2107. 1965. So, good news and bad news, Director. Good news, as I'm assuming you already heard. With the plans for construction of Site-56, all thanks to a certain Mr. Lockheed, the Kraken Protocol's getting a much-needed expansion. With its relative proximity to both the Lily of the Valley Nexus and the Pacific Northwest, it's a perfect opportunity to expand the scope of SCP-1000's containment while ensuring the ASCII doesn't suck LOTV dry before we get to it. For all its oddities, SCP-378 appears to be delighted at the prospect of a change in scenery. I can't imagine a tropical centipede grub likes having a sphere of influence limited to New England of all places, but that's besides the point. Its A was compliant enough on the way there. Which leads me to the bad news. Rupert Tremont's a fun little guy. Agent of the FBI's unofficial, unusual incidents unit, and all too stupid to trust Agent Ryans with his drink while he went to the restroom. After that, it's a matter of transport back to Provisional Area 56 in Black Rock, and a centipede down the gullet. Problem comes up when 378 tells us it can't establish a connection. Now, Tremont's still alive, so that's not normal. We run a number of tests, try to figure out what went wrong. And that's when we see a different centipede in his head, where our centipede usually goes. More to come, but I have a bad feeling about this. Item number, SCP-400. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. The single colony of SCP-400 in Foundation custody, designation SCP-400-B, is currently housed in a juvenile humanoid containment cell at Site-77's Euclid Objects Wing. Any cell containing an active SCP-400 colony must be secured with an airlock door under Biosafety Level 4 precautions. 
Any openings for ventilation must be covered by a metal screen with gaps no greater than 0.2 centimeters in diameter, followed by aerosol filter 400 AF to be changed monthly and remanded to on-site chemical research personnel with level 3 slash 400 clearance. Access for experimentation purposes requires approval from both the Ethics Committee and the Items Acting HMCL Supervisor, currently Dr. Marshall Grant. SCP-400 handlers are required to wear level 4 positive pressure biohazard suits and must be decontaminated prior to egress. In emergency situations, prevention of olfactory contact with SCP-400 is sufficient to prevent accidental exposure in most cases. For caregiving instructions, please refer to Document 400C Rev 1.3. Agents operating in the continental United States are to report any statistically significant drop in daycare, preschool, and primary school enrollment in their assigned region. Elements of MTF Beta 7, Maz Hatters, are to remain on call for identification, research, and termination of active SCP 400 infestations. Locations found to be infested are to be quarantined using cover story 139B, Bubonic Plague. Media inquiries are to be categorically denied, and all agents of the press demonstrating interest in the quarantine are to be detained and administered a Class B amnestic prior to release. Foundation personnel affected by SCP-400 are subject to quarantine of up to three weeks. If by this time anomalous effects have subsided, personnel are subject to psychological evaluation prior to return to duty. If anomalous effects are still present after the administration of a Class A amnestic, Remaining personnel may be reassigned to non-anomalous research, administrative, and medical positions. Civilians exposed are to be administered a Class A amnestic prior to release. Please refer to Document 401-R for reintegration instructions by geographic region. Damage control for infestations affecting population centers of 500 persons or more may employ amnestic agent NUE-2 locally, if necessary. At least one active SCP-400 colony must be collected from all subsequent infestations and remanded to genetic research personnel with level 3 slash 400 clearance. Description SCP-400 is the collective designation for an anomalous species of arthropod similar to Armadillidium vulgare, or the common pill bug. SCP-400 individuals are morphologically similar to A. vulgare in appearance but can be distinguished visually by bright red striping patterns on their dorsal carapace. Visual identification is only possible by individuals not under the influence of SCP-400's anomalous effects. SCP-400 is a parasitic organism, which feeds on human mammary secretions. Access to this food source is gained by habitation and manipulation of deceased human infants. Affected persons are subject to a Type 3 cognitohazard via a pheromone vector, which repurposes the natural child-rearing instincts present in all humans for its own feeding and protection. Those subject to this effect are unable to perceive SCP-400, or the damage it causes to infants. Exposure to D-Class assets has determined that the effect does not apply to video or audio surveillance and that Level 4 biohazard precautions are sufficient in preventing the effect's onset. Personnel briefed on SCP-400's effects show no special immunity to the false perceptions created by the anomaly. As of 1407-2005, the Ethics Committee has determined that future human experimentation with SCP-400 will only be allowed in unique and dire circumstances. As such, all information regarding SCP-400's relationship with humans and life cycle have been compiled from extensive surveillance and interviews conducted in the site of SCP-400's discovery. Conclusions are based on an observational period, from August 2003 through July 2005. Infestation begins when 25 to 50 instances of SCP-400 select an infant and access its crib. Precise criteria for this selection is unknown. In the seven colonies observed from inception, infant targets were between three weeks and two months of age. Upper and lower age bounds for infestation have not been established. Observation has failed to detect any instance of SCP-400 prior to appearance within the target crib. Parents and D-Class personnel present will be unable to perceive SCP-400. 
If any person passes within 0.5 meters of the infant, SCP-400 instances will collectively release a fine spray, which causes immediate disorientation and rapid loss of consciousness. SCP-400 will then begin to burrow into the flesh of the sleeping infant. Favored points of entry include the mouth, eyes, anus, navel, and armpits. The infant will not react to the presence of SCP-400 in any fashion, suggesting the use of local anesthetics. Cardiopulmonary activity in the infant will cease within the first 40 minutes of this procedure, and within 3-5 to five hours, movement will resume, followed by strained vocalizations. At this point, the infant is considered an active colony of SCP-400. Incapacitated subjects will awaken soon after the first vocalization and investigate. Parents or other adults present within earshot will also show interest as per normal for distressed infant vocalization. If the original mother of the colony is present at this time, she will immediately begin breastfeeding, regardless of previous feeding schedule or practices. Over roughly the next 10 weeks, parents and other adults begin to show increased affection and protectiveness toward the colony. During this stage, direct observation by present adults and children will be unable to detect any abnormalities in the colony's physiology, despite numerous dermal perforations and jerky, unnatural movement. The colony is capable of basic vocalization and is able to emulate feeding, defecation, and play behaviors of normal infants with increasing proficiency. Decomposition is still visible via surveillance during this time culminating in desiccation of the colony's remaining soft tissues. It is presumed that the final desiccation is an adaptation of SCP-400, developed to ensure the colony's continued structural integrity. By the end of the twelfth week, all observed colonies exhibited increased size, such that individual instances of SCP-400 are visible moving under the skin. Such colonies are considered mature and individual instances will begin reproductive behavior during this period. During feeding, 7 to 12 SCP-400 individuals will exit the colony through one of its dermal perforations and take hold of any exposed portion of the host mother's skin for approximately 10 minutes before returning. Host mothers studied during this time begin to show increased progesterone production as well as heightened levels of human chorionic gonadotropin indicating an induced pregnancy. After an incubation period of two to three days, host mothers will birth 25 to 50 instances of SCP-400 during her next sleep. Instances of SCP-400 have not been successfully tracked after birth. Maximum interval of dormancy before SCP-400 must initiate another infestation is unknown. After breeding behavior begins, the cycle will repeat once weekly for the duration of the infestation. No natural limit to SCP-400 infestation timeline has been observed. Of recorded infestations to date, all have occurred in the southeastern United States, in rural or mountainous areas, and in some cases, have gone unnoticed for as long as nine months. Improved detection and extermination of SCP-400 instances is considered a high research priority. Addendum 401 Interview 425 Forward 25th in a series of interviews conducted during the infestation of 2003. Mrs. B. Interviewed by Dr. Marshall Grant, Agent Fabian Pertucci observing. Mrs. B. has served as host mother to SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B simultaneously. The advanced state of decomposition suggests the colonies have been active for over two years. She and her deceased twins are considered strong candidates for patient SCP-400-0. At the time of interview, Mrs. B was isolated from SCP-400 for 15 days. Interview conducted on 10-7-2005. Dr. Grant. Good afternoon. How are we feeling today? Mrs. B. Where are my babies? What have you done with my babies? Dr. Grant, your children are being treated for possible bubonic plague exposure, ma'am. They will be returned to you as soon as possible. Mrs. B, 
subject strikes table. Oh, that's bullshit. You can't keep them from me. You have no right to keep a mother from her children. Tell me where they are or so help me when my husband's lawyers hear of this. Dr. Grant, Mrs. B, we're on your side here. We want to help. If you'll just answer a few questions for me, we'll do everything we can to let you see them this afternoon. Mrs. B, I've already told you on the form. They're three months old, male, names expunged, identical twins, weigh about 10 pounds, they don't have any allergies. What more do you want from me? Dr. Grant, you said three months old? When were they born? Mrs. B, February 5th, 2003. Now will you- I'm sorry, I'm just- I love them so much. Never thought I would be much of a mother, but they have been such a joy. After my husband died, subject is silent for 15 seconds. They mean the world to me. I don't know what I would do without them. Not a day goes by, I don't feel blessed. Dr. Grant, I imagine you must. For the record, you're aware of today's date. Mrs. B, it's July the 10th, 2000 Huh, well that's funny. I could have sworn they were only three months. My, time does fly. I must have a picture of them here somewhere. Subject accesses personal effects and produces a portrait of SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B prior to infestation. Here it is. Aren't they just so beautiful? Dr. Grant. Yes, ma'am. Now, has there been anything peculiar about your boys? Mrs. B. Well, there was that time in May when that doctor... No, nothing at all. If anything, they're doing too well. So healthy and full of life. I swear, little said Mama just yesterday. Dr. Grant. I'm sorry, what was that about a doctor? Mrs. B. Yes, he came to the house after they... Three second pause. Subject visibly confused. I didn't say anything about a doctor. Let me see my children, please. They're probably starving by now. They need to be fed. Agent Pertucci. Inaudible to Mrs. B. We're losing her. Come back to it. Dr. Grant. I assure you, ma'am, we're giving them the best care possible. Mrs. B. With that awful formula, I'll bet. Threw up the last time I tried that. Neither of them has touched it since. No, it's natural breast milk for them 100%. My obstetrician said that they'll need it for at least another three months, and I'm not about to take any risks. Dr. Grant. Isn't two and a half years a little long to be breastfeeding? Mrs. B. They're, they're only three months old. Dr. Grant. But just now, you had said... Mrs. B. I know what I said. It's your fault. Got my head all turned around. Dr. Grant. I'm sorry if I've confused you, ma'am. It's just... Mrs. B. Who the hell are you people anyway? Let me see my babies. At this point in the interview, Mrs. B refused to answer any further questions and exhibited increased emotional distress and separation anxiety. Post-interview medical examination revealed extensive ovarian and uterine trauma in excess of all other host mothers examined. Mrs. B was administered a Class A amnestic when observations were concluded and is currently under Foundation surveillance as a person of interest. Addendum 402 As of 14-7-2010, SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B have been active in Foundation custody for five years, indicating that colonies may be able to survive indefinitely if continually provided with food. Level 4 biohazard precautions have successfully prevented not only reproduction of SCP-400, but also the spread of all cognitohazardous effects within Site-77. Limited access for experimentation may be granted with approval from the Ethics Committee and SCP-400's HMCL supervisor, currently Dr. Grant. Please allow up to 30 days for review prior to beginning any new line of experimentation. Addendum 403 On 5-10-2010, SCP-400-A ceased activity while in containment, 
after ingesting an experimental nutritional supplement, allowing medical examiners to dissect the colony. Despite desiccation and decomposition, muscle tissues remain responsive to electric stimuli. Highest concentrations of SCP-400 can be found in the stomach, mouth, brain case, and spinal column. Of particular note is the presence of individual specimens periodically along major motor nerves in the extremities, indicating an unprecedented level of communal intellect, utilizing the infant's extant neural architecture. Examination of the pheromones produced by individual SCP-400 instances has revealed several hallucinogenic, amnestic, and soporific compounds, which are capable of reproducing SCP-400's cognitohazardous effects. Analysis of several compounds has revealed similarities to Class B and C amnestics currently in use by the Foundation, indicating a possible security breach, minimal risk. Aerosol concentrations of the mixture as low as 50 ppm have proven effective in initiating the effect. Further research into the genetic sequencing of SCP-400 is recommended. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.